Welcome back to Le Mans. I'm Stuart Hall, joined with Jeremy Shaw and Carlton Kirby. At the moment, we see the number 008 signature Aston Martin in the pits with front end damage. It looks quite caught quite a lot of damage. It went off at the first chicane, the middle part of the first chicane, and um, it looks like there's not only bodywork damage but uh, front uh, right suspension damage as well. So I think the car is going to be going to be in the pits for some time. It was having a very very good run in eighth place at the time. So let's hope they can get that part car repaired and. Uh, out as quickly as possible. And it's been a good six or seven minutes during all since that car went off at that first UK. We never did see a replay of the accident, but it was, it was uh, heavily buried into the tire wall there. Pierre Rag, we believe, was at the wheel of the car, although it's now shown as Benito accidentally made the driver change already, but perhaps they had. Uh, but they, he, he, was, he or she was able to lift that car back to the pit lane. There is, uh, however, as you say, quite extensive damage. Well, the good news is they've still got uh, a, la a gap of about two laps and a bit more over Andy Merrick, who's the next place car in the overall classification, car number six. That's the Orica Aim, which has the open top sports car of the Orica Matwood team. Uh, and they are running ninth place. Let's back to the uh, set, the, the, the uh, scene at the front of the field. It's still this Roman Juma who uh, leads now in the car number nine, the Audi R15 Plus, the vastly reworked car from a very unsuccessful debut with the R15 uh, concept last year. That car is running out in front of the field by around about 34 seconds of the Marcel Fessler in car number eight. Anthony Davidson is uh, just over a lap behind in the sole remaining factory Peugeot, and he's closing as a general average at around about three seconds out. last time around for Anthony Davidson another stunningly quick lap three minutes 20.6 I've just been trying to do some calculations if Anthony Davidson is able to gain on the race leader an average of three seconds a lap generally the, the cars are doing around about 70 laps to an hour so that would mean he would gain about 50 seconds per hour on the race leader if he was able to maintain that margin without any other delays to the end of the race it might actually be quite close mark cole is with us and mark it's a fascinating uh, prospect i think for here for us we've had a, a topsy-turvy race we saw the peugeots completely in control through all the opening stages and really through the night as well all of a sudden it's been handed, been handed to audi with the various difficulties and now can that sole remaining factory peugeot the number one car anthony davidson at the wheel he'll share it with mark Janay, uh, and alex Wurtz. can they make up that deficit and, you know, they, yeah, they have to push absolutely flat out the whole way yeah a couple of hours ago we, uh, we were trying to work this out and of course the gap then was two laps uh, Anthony's brought that down at the moment. Uh, we believe he did the fastest lap of the race a little earlier, a 3.19.5, actually quicker than Montana's lap. And uh, we haven't got a confirmation of that at the moment, but we've been keeping a sort of fairly loose record of that. So Anthony has, as far as we know, been the fastest man here at Le Mans this year. Um, he can do it. Of course he can. It's, uh, well, it's a one very close. Yeah. Fact, he, he's, got to, he's got to maintain at least... Uh, a three second advantage all the way through the end of the race, I reckon it's very, yeah. very close. But of course, the advantage Audi has is Audi, Audi have got solid cars. Oh, and he's off. He's just gone off. Oh, dear, yeah. oh, dear. That's coming into the Ford chicane and uh, not good. Was he coming into uh, the pits anyway? Yeah, and was coming into the pits there and just got it, um, just went when there's a little sort of chicane as you come into the pits just as you slow the car down. And it just like a, he went into the right far too quickly, which when he understeered out onto the kerb, he launched himself over the kerb, which almost launched him back onto the track. So we could have had a Frank Beeler situation where he, he, he missed the pit lane and uh, he'd have had to go around and do another lap and therefore he could have run out of fuel, but that hasn't happened. He managed to get it back into the pit lane and uh, he's handing over now to so Alexander Wurtz. This is the 27th stop for that Peugeot. Fassler's had 27 stops. Dumas has had only 26. So we'll expect him to make one soon. Uh, Alan McNish, 27 as well. So they're very much all on the same thing. But my goodness, Stuart, you don't want to do this to a car this late in the race, do you? That's how, that's how you brake cars, coming down heavily on those curbs. Well, as we saw in qualifying, uh, at a much higher speed, uh, uh, Sebastian Bourdais went off at Tet Rouge, launched the car up into the Air, it landed very heavily as, as it's, and as Jeremy pointed out last night that could have contributed to the uh, the, the tub the tub suspension damage that forced that car out of the race and we see uh, Juan Barazzi again oh, having dear. a spin in that 009 Aston Martin uh, Christian Backward must be rubbing his hands together there he is there in shot now but uh, I think he may he may now be on the same lap as Juan Barazzi so uh, game on for the uh, Audi R10 catching yeah, Aston that Martin uh, 
that's the sixth place car and of course it's a very easy place to do that you either go straight on into the wall or you boot it too early and the back steps out down here at Arnage and that is the second spin in this stint for Juan Barazzi so that's exactly what that 009 team doesn't need the car's been running flawlessly as we heard David Richards from ProDrive tell us not too long ago but boy that's a scary spot Marshall out in the middle of the race track which sounds strict what the heck's that guy doing on the apex of the corner that to me is absolutely ridiculous quite frankly but uh, these guys know what they're doing, they've done a fabulous job through the rest of the race, they've got the car running again, and no harm, no foul, away goes that car. The, you know, that, uh, that pit stop by Anthony Davidson, it did look like, like it was a, a scheduled pit stop, didn't it? He seemed to be in the pit lane when he had an incident here again as a replay yeah. of these guys. That's uh, a bit frightening for me. That is um, very dangerous. Well, for anybody, quite frankly, I think. But uh, the, the odd thing is, uh, he'd only done 11 laps on that stint, and generally they've been running at least 12, and generally 13 in that car number one. So whether it was a late decision to come on the pit lane, I don't know. Well, uh, it'd be interesting to find that one out. Yeah, what's the news, by the way, on the Frank Kitty car? It's still sitting in the pits. I didn't hear what the... Uh, engine problem of some sort. Engine it's, problem. Yeah, it's been, uh, still there, but uh, that's amazing, isn't it? Suddenly, Straka, it's all come back to him. Even with the, the slower driver, Nick Leventis, the uh, the gentleman driver, that's just come into their hands. Seven-lap lead at the moment, Stuart. Uh, but you mustn't back off at all, must you? You've got to keep pushing, because the moment you, you stop pushing, you lose your concentration. No, you really, really can't stop pushing, as we saw. Uh, Vanini X, a really, really long face there, suggest it wasn't... Uh, um, it wasn't Pierre Rag? Apologies to Pierre Rag. It wasn't Pierre Rag in the car. I think it may have been uh, Vanina Ricks, as uh, David Richards said. But uh, as to Martin wheeling out Darren Turner, Juan Barazzi is obviously, obviously that was his in lap, and uh, Backward's getting very close. So he's going. They're going to roll out the. Uh, the ace card. Yeah, if it wasn't planned to be his in-lap, it certainly is now. He's going to bring that car in and hand it over to uh, uh, to uh, Darren Turner. Now, you, you, you've had David Richards up this morning. I've, I've just been with Martin Brain for five minutes, having a chat about everything. Very, very happy of progress. We had him on the programme last night, telling us uh, that he, they have got plans for next year. He won't tell us what the plans are, but uh, obviously, well, well advanced, the plans for the new um, Lolas for LMP one next year as these cars become grandfathered but uh, I think he's very very pleased quietly that you know they are leading petrol again uh, yes and, and it, it is it, for, for, <laughs> it's, it's a Lola for who you wanted to be a Lola it's an Aston Martin for who you wanted to be an Aston Martin technically <laughs> it's a Lola Aston Martin but uh, whatever I'd like to think it's British and we're lead petrol car and uh, that's fantastic <laughs> And the British car, of course, way up there towards the front. Well, British, sorry, British crude car, Anthony Davidson, still pushing so hard. Well, he was pushing so hard. Where's that car gone at the moment? The uh, <coughs> Alex van Zander Wertz still in third place in that car. Just had the handover, as we saw. And uh, Alex will probably do, what, a double stint now? I think so. Uh, double or even a triple, depending on how aggressive they're going to go to try and catch these two Audis. Yeah, four hours and 18 minutes left of this race, and what an extraordinary race it's been. There hasn't been a moment, well, I've been on air, certainly, probably 10 hours on air, where we haven't had something going on every five minutes. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I was down in the garage area about an hour or so ago, and just going, wherever I went to one garage, something else would happen somewhere else. I was planning on only spending about 20 minutes over there before I came back up here, but there was so much going on, I tried to try and find out at least what was going on in most of the garages. It was, just, it was wild, to be perfectly honest. And but, uh, I'm still wondering about that... that, uh, that pit stop of that number one car. It's certainly the first time that I can remember that car has only done 11 laps on one stint. And, uh, OK, he's been going very, very quickly, but I think even so, he should have been able to do at least 12. To me, that, that, that uh, pit stop is at least one lap earlier, at least one lap earlier than they had originally anticipated. Well, it's just possible that Anton is going towards his hours, you know. It's, uh, he's been in the car for a long time, not, not all at one time, but uh, certainly we came on about 7.15 this morning. He's just getting in the car then, and it's now, what, uh, 10.40, so... Three it, and a half hours, it, yeah. it, it is possible, uh, Mark, as we see the BMW going very slowly. This is not what we want to see. Those guys have been doing a fantastic job. They've had a lot thrown at them in the last uh, sort of 21 hours, and... Uh, you know, this is this is not this is not good. The team the team deserve a good finish. Yeah, they actually got themselves up to 21st place. You're Muller at the wheel here behind the uh, Porsches and the Ferraris. Okay, it's, it's a tryout this year. We know that it's a. We've, we've had this discussion before the thread that is it a touring car? Is it a GT car? The answer from BMW is a touring car has four doors. This only has two doors. I think it is a GT car. It's, it's, their, first, it's their first year at Le Mans. You you know, you can't expect uh, to come come with that car the first year with that car and um, 
especially with the with the amendments they've had to make to the rear suspension and everything in the last few months and just blow everyone away i think they've done a, a fantastic job so far and um of course, I think they'll be back very, very strongly indeed. Yeah, of course. What, what, what's hanging over them is the fact they've come straight here from Nurburgring 24 hours where they, they blitzed it, won it outright, and so well, I think much more was expected of them. Yeah, they didn't blitz it, did they? Because they, they, they <laughs> took over the, the lead yeah. of the race for the last few hours when the, uh, the hybrid, that, that fascinating hybrid uh, Porsche failed. Uh, and then, of course, the, the gearbox in that BMW, that was struggling towards them. Oh, they, yes. they were down the gear, and so they were kind of limping home to yeah, the end. But it was a, a wonderful a success for them. I mean, they, uh, they did. They, they barely even dreamed of winning that race, I think, when they went into it, but they came away with, as you say, a magnificent success. And I think as a result of that success, they kind of uh, knocked themselves on the head a bit because the uh, organisers of the Le Mans series said, yeah, they re we reckon that car's going a bit quickly. They had uh, put on a slightly smaller air restrictor, restricted the amount of air that goes into the engine uh, by 0.6 of a millimetre, which doesn't sound very much, but uh, Dr. Mario Tyson reckons that cost him probably about 10 horsepower. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, 10 horsepower at this level, uh, you know, it's, it might be you know, 450 horsepower or so, but still, it, it's a significant difference, particularly when you come to a place which is all about horsepower and straight line speed. Uh, you, you just mentioned in that, Jeremy, about the the Porsche hybrid, the car that was leading it at the Nurburgring. We had Dr. Daniel Alderson up last night from uh, Porsche Motorsport. He's the guy responsible for the hybrid program. They use the Williams input for the. Uh, the hybrid flywheel, um, sort of curve systems, etc. We asked him the question, the, the new rules allow you to transfer this hybrid power through a, a second axle if you want. And he said, yes, we are not ruling out four-wheel drive if we come back to Le Mans next year. But the, uh, the new rules for next year, they only allow, do they not, the... Um, the you can only use the, the, the hybrid power on two wheels, on one axle. On, on, on one right? axle. So what they do, you've got your normal back axle yes. on the Porsche, they would u they would utilise the front axle for the, the hybrid boost they get. Fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. I love that sort of technology. That was a great thing, I think, about uh, Le Mans series racing, uh, both uh, in, uh, in Europe and the American Le Mans series uh, in the States. It's all about technology and advancement technology, and particularly kind of you know, greener technology or advanced technologies, which is somewhat lacking now in many other forms of motorsports. Well, we have seen in the in the American Le Mans series um, the the Zytec hybrid uh, with Johnny Molum, who's been up in the box quite a lot during this race, and uh, you know that's had that's had some good results. So uh, that's certainly, and we've seen in F1 that technology is available, and we're we're sure to see it really really doing well in sports cars soon. So your mother's still uh, crawling around the circuit, out of your sight at the moment, as we watch the number. Nine. Nine car, yes, at the lead car. Roman Dumas, that uh, distinctive white helmet of his. Andre Lotter in second place, and Alex Wurtz for Peugeot third. Alan McNish in fourth. And again, this uh, maybe we, what we're seeing, Jeremy, is the change of the old order now. All these young drivers, particularly in the lead car, three three Porsche heroes coming in, drafted in by Audi, and uh, they've really carried the race for Audi. Yeah, the Porsche Audi, you know, VW all getting together here. Mike Rockefeller, he's 26 years old. Timo Bernhard's 29. Roman Dumas at the wheel right now. He's the oldest of the bunch at 32, the Frenchman in this team. And he lead the lead now over that second place car of Andre Lotterer is up to uh, almost exactly two minutes. And about, what, an hour and a half ago, the, the gap between them was about a, a minute and 20 seconds. So he's pulled out about uh, 30 seconds over the last hour and a half. Meanwhile, Alex Verts, he's still running hard there in third place, but at the moment not going much quicker than the Audis. We're going to be back with you in a few moments here on Eurosport. We'll see the, the uh, BMW number 78 being pushed away into the garage. Stay with us. Jeremy Shaw with Mark Cole and Stuart Hall. Welcome back to Eurosport. Jeremy Shaw with Stuart Hall and Chris Parsons has joined us right again in the group here above the main straight and overlooking the pit lane at the Circuit de la Sarthe for the 78th running of this endurance classic the 24 hours at Le Mans. We're watching Romain Dumas, the race leader, last time around at 3 minutes 25.4 in the Audi R15 Plus. He's got a lead of about two minutes over his teammate Andre Lotterer in third place. The sole surviving factory Peugeot, Alex Wurtz at the wheel of car number one, and Chris Parsons. We've seen this uh, race ebb and flow all the way through, haven't we? We've got, uh, we're almost uh, 20 hours into the race. It initially, it looked like a Peugeot route. Now it's an Audi 1 2, and we've seen everything in between as well. But isn't that all about sports car racing, endurance racing? 
we were we were talking at two o'clock this morning about uh, how how quiet it was. We knew there would be an explosion of, of, of interest as soon as the light started. As the light came up. Why it is when when the light comes up, we don't know. They're lapping just as fast at two o'clock in the morning as they are at five or five or six o'clock in the morning. But you 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 go through these phases in, in every endurance race. When it goes a little bit quiet, you know it won't be long, and just around the corner there will always be interest. And it's it's just here. Here we are, Jeremy. You know, it's one of those races. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's why we love this sort of racing, and uh, and that's why uh, at least a couple hundred thousand people are here to watch this race as well. You see a few of them there out amongst the trees. There's all sorts of vantage points. It's a, a great uh, track here. You can there's, uh, there's a, a wide variety of places to watch from. There's the the dead car park. Not so good. Those guys all out on the race, and several cars out on the track as well. We've seen all sorts of dramas, but you know, I don't think the, the final drama is over. I went away about three o'clock last night I left and I came back about 7.15 I think or thereabouts and not much had changed uh, and then uh, just about the moment I walked into the racetrack Frank Montani's engine blew his car number, the car number two the Peugeot had been leading the race very comfortably the, that engine blew uh, moments before that the uh, engine in the number 60 three GT2 class ED Corvette of Antonio Garcia that blew up as well since then we've seen uh, dramas in GT1 we had the Celine S7R the kind of a 50 Labra competition car that's running it's, as a result of attrition that's taken over the lead of the class that was off the road as well with a spin steer all we just don't know which way to look it certainly is all kicking off isn't it Jeremy we just had a shot uh, a little while ago of the uh, sole remaining BMW in the race in the garage uh, we saw that going slowly on the track about five, six minutes ago. It looked to me that they were changing the drive shaft. It, it looked like they were the, the mechanics had a new drive shaft in hand, and that's what they were putting into the to, to, to the back of the car. So that's that's probably the reason why it was going a little bit slowly. Yeah, good point. And here is a look at uh, uh, Alex Burtz now has taken the wheel of car number one. Anthony Davidson did a fantastic stint, triple stint in that car. He did the car for we reckon probably over three hours. Uh, and was able to make up a lot of ground on the two Audis ahead of him. Since then, Alex Wirth, well, that, that lap around was a 3 minutes 21.4, which I'm fairly sure is the fastest lap he's uh, turned since he got behind the wheel of that car, which was on lap 318. So he's done now uh, eight laps uh, in this stint, Alex, and he seemed to be struggling a little bit. Maybe it was just traffic, whatever. He certainly hasn't made up as much ground on the Audis, as the, as the car was doing about an hour or so ago. No, we, we've had our calculators out. The old um, pens have been sharpened. It, it's looking very close, but it really is going to be run a close run thing. And as you say, Jeremy, the harder they push, the more often they have to stop. And, and lately, the, the margin between the Peugeot and the Audis has not been large enough, I don't believe, to make up that deficit, which now is it's, uh, it's well over a lap from car number nine, leading the race to car number one in third place. Meanwhile, the fastest car on the track at the moment is Loic Duval in the number four Orica Matmut Peugeot. He's only about a minute and... Uh, Minutes and change behind Alan McNish in the battle for fourth and fifth. And another guy who's charging at the moment is Darren Turner. We saw John Barati make a couple of spins during his last stint over an hour or so at the wheel of car number 009. The first of the petrol engine car, the Lola Aston Martin. And he's handed over to Darren Turner and Darren has put the foot down. He certainly have. He'll, he'll have been given the instructions by the, uh, by the AMR crew to go out there and uh, do what he does best because... Uh, Juan had a number of little issues in that car and uh, that has allowed Christian Baccarat in the uh, number 15 Collars Audi to catch up. But now uh, now Darren's out in the car, he's, he's that lap he was 10 seconds quicker than Baccarat so he really is flying right now. It's just turned the quickest lap that car has done all race which is a 3 minute 25.4. So um, Darren driving well. Um, looking at uh, Alain Roman Dumas' uh, last lap, that's uh, a 29 which really is giving away quite a lot to uh, Alexander Wurtz who, who turned in a 21 so eight seconds that lap you don't want too many more laps like that do you Stuart? No you don't Chris uh, that's, that's great we're seeing now is that is that is that Roman this this might be why he's done a 29 if that is Roman because um, yeah that is Roman yes. Dumas getting stuck behind the uh, stacker racing car of Nick Leventis and it actually looked like they could have had a little bit of contact uh, 
from the angle, from from our angle, it looked as much. But uh, you know, with these uh, with these camera angles, they can be very, very deceiving. As we know, earlier in the race, there were a lot. There was a lot of controversy about the safety car and uh, where the, the 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 three safety cars and the time that that cost the uh, the Audi team. So it. It could, it could easily sway another safety car period or a couple of safety car periods and a bad call and it could be it could all come down very quickly indeed. Yes, it's definitely there is all to play for. It, it's still very, very tight. There's still over four hours to go of this race and uh, anything can happen in four hours. So uh, it's all very exciting right now. Well, hello, everybody. I am back after my break and about 14 cups of coffee. And um, <laughs> speaking of Audi, I've just uh, I've just bumped into Dindo Capello, actually, when I was on break, and I had a quick chat with him, and he said they're in an interesting situation at the moment because they're having to push very, very hard to stay in front of the Peugeot number four, but at the same time, they don't feel that they can actually catch number one. So he said it's a very interesting situation they're in where they can't really fight for a place above them, but they must push like they are in order to avoid losing the place they're in. And all they can do is hope that maybe some ill fate comes up to Alexander Wirtz. But I wonder if uh, Audi would have dreamt on, on after qualifying on Thursday that they could be in this situation on Sunday morning. I, th I think surely not. They, they, they couldn't have believed that they would be up in front. It's still all to play for. We'll be back with you soon. We're just going to a quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Eurosport. I'm Stuart Hall, joined with Liz Halliday and Mark Cole. Mark, you have some information for us. Yeah, we've just been uh, scrolling through all the help we've been given by DailySportsCar.com. Thank you, guys. Just confirmation of uh, Giancarlo Fisichella's accident earlier on. Told them I had brake failure, which is uh, after his trip down the escape road. High Croft, we're told now it's uh, water pressure problems. They've had a lot of problems with the alarm going off over that. They thought it was an alarm sensor, but they've now discovered of that it is in fact water pressure problems so they're having a major rebuild of the water systems there uh, the lamborghini the j-lock lamborghini is now an official retirement we're going for an interview olivier pan is a vrai du problème pendant la nuit maintenant ça marche bien avec la voiture Oui, tout se passe bien. C'est dommage. C'est so vrai big que problems for you in the night, Olivier. Sur le podium, mais en tout cas, toute l'équipe attend qu'on essaie. We're not going to make the podium now, he says. Donc on va rien lâcher jusqu'à la fin, et puis on fera les comptes à la fin. We're doing everything we can to just climb back up through the rankings. Dans la voiture après le le relais de Nicolas, et puis on va essayer de de pousser vraiment. I'm going to be getting back in the car soon. Ouais, c'est quoi le maximum ici? Then I'll drive to the end. Get a good result, hopefully. At the moment, we're fifth. Bearing in mind all the retirements we've had so far, let's see what sort of result we can get. So Olivier walks off into the sunset there, and uh, we haven't seen much of him in the race, have we? Uh, Liz, he's been. Uh, it seems to have been like Nick Lapierre who's done the bulk of the driving while we've been on and uh, I, I was actually thinking this morning where's, where's Olivier? I think maybe <laughs> Olivier has been on the same shifts or opposite <laughs> shifts to us hasn't he? I think we've just missed him in our little so to speak driver changes we've had up here um, so some other information I ran into um, Tiff Nadell when we were when I was down on, on my break and um, he's been doing some filming for the number 11 car and uh, he, he was asking me he said they're not going to get black flagged are they if they you know, don't quite make their limit for their amount of driving they need to have. He said they've made the 50% at 9 a.m. He said, but, you know, they might not make it to the race finish. And I said, no, no, I don't think they'll black flag you. But, you know, a lot of teams quit. And he said, well, we're not a lot of teams. They want to carry on. They want to finish the race. I've just spoken to another team member on my way back over here. And he said, as long as they can keep it running, they are going to keep it going to the checkered flag unless someone stops them. Some man, beast or other creation <laughs> tries to stop them. So they are fighting strong, the race and racing crew. Well, fighting talk there, as you say, but uh, we have Roman Dumas coming into the pits in the number nine leading Audi. A little bit of a lock-up into the pit lane, but so that shows they are pushing awfully hard. Looks to me like he's handing over to Mike Rockenfeller now, so that will be full service, tyres, driver and fuel, and they'll they'll head the, uh, the number nine car back out on his way. That'll be lots of time to push for Mike Rockenfeller. It's definitely closing up a little bit here on the front runners. And um, I can see Alan McNish still pushing as hard as he can, trying to catch that Peugeot of Alexander Wurtz. But I think it's really going to be a struggle for them to upset the top three at the moment. It's all going to be down to whether or not something goes wrong. And it still could happen. We've got a good four hours left to the end of this race. There's still very much to play for, isn't there, Mark? 
Yes, indeed. That absolutely is. Uh, and it's just going to be so, so exciting now, isn't it? Uh, we've got at least uh, two and a half Grand, Grands Prix to go. Good news for Jean Lacy lovers talking of Grand Prix. That car is back in the running now. It's in fourth place after those front end repairs. As we heard, Giancarlo Fisichella had brake failure, went straight on the escape road. They had to rebuild the whole front of the car. In fact, they were using every single type of widget and gadget to, to knit it together. A lot of fiberglass damage, uh, carbon fiber damage at the front there. That car now in 22nd place overall. And we say back in fourth in class, John Lacey at the wheel. He's behind Richard Leeds for Porsche, Dominic Farnbacker for the Felbermeyer Ferrari, and uh, Timo Scheider, the two times DTM champion, driving in the 97 Porsche. And of course, that number 77 car is still leading this race. I ran into Mark Lieb, and he looked very, very tired. In fact, that's pretty much the only words he could figure out was under the dark circles in his eyes. He just said, I'm so tired. We're double stinting. He said the car is very, very difficult to drive. They're trying as hard hard as they can to keep it up in front and keep hold of the lead but I think that's important for, for the viewers to know is that the GT2 cars are just as difficult if not more difficult sometimes than the LMP cars most I would say none of them are triple stinting they're all doing double stints and and when I said I said oh are you not doing any triples having a bit of a prototype blonde moment there because I've only driven prototypes here and he said he looked at me a bit silly and went no 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 we don't triple stint these cars and I thought well of course I, you know I've driven GT cars I know how difficult they are but you just sort of think the way you know it them all and, and certainly they are working just as hard as the guys at the front of the grid. Well, you sorry, Mark. After you. After well, you always think with uh, they always say that the prototypes are more physical car to drive because of the the, the g forcing load, but. Uh, what you don't understand in the GT car is uh, you've got most of the time you've got a big front engine in front of you. It's very, very, very hot inside. The car's moving around an awful lot. There's not a massive amount of downforce, so you're always working at the wheel. You never really have a time time to rest, which means you know you do get very tired very quickly. Right, just looking at the number one car, incidentally going back out. Alex Verts at the wheel. He's taken over. He took over at the last stop from uh, Anthony Davidson. Uh, Anthony Davidson has been uh, cornered. We, we got hold of him finally. He said, uh, they told me to push, so I pushed like hell. Everybody's blaming me for the incident with the Corvette, but it was absolutely his fault. It was Manu's fault. I went for the inside, I had the racing line, and there was no contact. That's what he's been uh, telling Daily Sports Car. Um, on, on going off the track to make an overtake, you, you remember he ran off onto the red section going down on, on the Mulsanne straight, for which he got a warning. He said, I don't care, I'm a racing driver. I'm here to win, not to finish third. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> no, I think, I think that's, that's exactly the attitude you need. Um, I, mean, I mean, and it's not going to... Well, as we all know, it's never, it's never your own fault, is it? You're never going to blame yourself. But really, that was a racing incident. He has been told to push. Um, there's no point part putting putting blame you know he's out there pushing he's out there trying to to win Le Mans for for Peugeot and he's going to do absolutely he's a racer he's going to do absolutely everything he possibly can do to do that and speaking of that same car that number one car I've just heard um, from Jeremy Shaw over here one of our co-commentators that uh, that car has actually made its second pit stop in about seven laps so that is not good news there could be a problem there they're still holding on to third place but that would be exactly what the car of Alan McNish wants to happen so so we're going to have to watch this space and see what happens yeah, there. Yeah, it was a, the, the previous stop was a, 11 laps, I think, and that one was seven. Jeremy's telling us, yeah. So that, that is yeah. uh, it's getting. Perhaps they've got a fuel pickup problem. Can't, can't. They could. We've got no idea. We'd only be no. speculating, but we'll just have to wait and see. But certainly, this is going to be the chance that maybe the number seven car would have, and certainly Audi is going to know exactly what's going well. on, and they're going to be on the radio saying, "Come on, Alan, keep pushing." Can you imagine, Liz? The uh, Peugeot started this race one, two, three, four. Audi could finish it one, two, three. I mean, can you imagine that? That would be one of the biggest upsets in the history of this race. I can't say I would. I would be upset. I love. The, I love them both. I love all the guys in, in in all the cars. But I think it would be an awesome, an awesome take back for Audi. And uh, just just going on the Verts coming into the pits again. There is there is a uh, little bit of uh, bodywork flap on that car, which did come off on the on the Mulsanne straight. So, uh, if you remember, they've been putting tank tape on that side of the car, so it's probably that coming off. Down to the pits. The car's going really well, Roman. Yeah, it's absolutely fine. 
C'est un peu délicat, mais en fait, on fait ça depuis le début de la course, donc on a notre rythme. We have, we've got everything we need to take this fight against Persia. We're doing our best to go even quicker, though. Big problems passing traffic. It's uh, just struggling to get by some of it. He said, well, Persia are going quickly, but uh, we're fairly confident we can stay there. But, well, he's going to say that, isn't he, of course? Uh, because I, I guess at the end of the day, they could just push forward. There's uh, Olivier Canal, the sporting director of Persia. Not a happy day for him, Liz. No, it hasn't been. I think it's been really difficult for them. And But certainly, I, I think uh, Roman Dumas has got to be quite happy. He's their number one Audi and number two, which is going to be a good little buffer there, isn't it, between that last remaining Peugeot and then, obviously, between the next Peugeot in line, we have another little buffer there of Alan McNish, who is, in fact, just coming down pit lane, I think. In just a moment, I think we're going to switch over to Eurosport International for all of you viewers, so yep. make sure that you move over with us. And uh, here comes Alan McNish down pit lane, number seven car. As this this looks like just a routine stop. We've got tyres lined up and ready, so I think we'll be doing a driver change. Yes, we are. Yep. Yeah, that'll go back to Tom Christensen. He hasn't been in the car for some time. So, um, as Liz said, we are going to be changing channels, so don't start throwing your toys at the TV set. We will still be live, uninterrupted. Just look for the Le Mans signal on whichever Eurosport channels you've got. We, we're not 100% sure with you, but we're certainly joining Eurosport International. So at the moment, this is uh, this holiday. Stuart Hall, Mark Cole and Chris Parsons here from Le Mans Live. Well, let's have a look, see what's been going on in this race here today. Four Peugeots starting at the front of the grid, and uh, that all went wrong very quickly on. Right, just scrolling through the field at the moment, looking at who the leaders are. We just saw Mike Rockefeller in the Audi. This is the Harry Leventis driven Stracker leading LMP2 at the moment. And in GT1, here we are. This is the Celine, the car everybody loves. Gabriel Gardel still at the wheel of that car. It's, uh, of course, underneath all that, it is a Ford. So even though Ford GTs might have gone out, we still have a Ford powered Celine leading GT1. Last time we'll see that category. And here, in the uh, Felbermeyer Porsche factory driver Wolf Hensler, 15th overall, leading GT2 after one of the most extraordinary GT2 battles we have ever seen here at the Mandlers. I think we've seen uh, three different manufacturers swap it around in GT2 already. So we've gone from Ferrari Corvette down to Porsche. So it's looking like Porsche might be able to pull this out of the bag. Yeah, and they, 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 they've been so desperate to do this. Twice beaten by Ferrari in the last two years by Rizzi Competizioni. They went out fairly early on. Rizzi had such a dreadful race, didn't they? So with you on Eurosport 2, um, looking at moment at the Hankook Barmbacker car, this is the Ferrari in second place, and Liz, this is the car that also took second at the Nürburgring 24 hours just two weeks ago. It is, what an accomplishment, I mean, especially for the team and for the car. This is a, a testament to what this team can do, because most teams, after completing a 24-hour race, especially one as difficult as the Nürburgring 24 hours, would do an entire car rebuild. It would be a major process. and just to turn it around that fast to come here and be this competitive at the Le Mans 24 hours the biggest 24 hour race in the world it's a really big testament to Ferrari and to all of the boys that have worked hard there I mean if, if, if the Porsche heads only got down a problem and they could pull off the double that would be something for Hankook tyres that would be incredible yeah I mean one of our smaller tyre manufacturers here but there are a few cars running on Hankook and, and over the last couple years that that tyre manufacturer has really found great leaps and bounds in sports car racing and it's nice to see them so successful with a car like Ferrari 
It is, Liz, and uh, that car going very, very well as we see the number 97 Porsche 997 uh, GT3 RSR with DTM racer Timo Schneider at the wheel. Now, he's, he's a debut, he's, it was his first Le Mans and uh, doing a very, very good job. They're third in class. Absolutely, and this is this has clawed its way back up through the rankings as well. Not too long ago, we were seeing the whole front of the field dominated by Corvette, followed by Ferrari, who then lost out. Then it was Porsche, and now Porsche is clawing its way back up, as we have said. Number 25 car, the RML car, going back out of pit lane. They've had a few problems, but are also working their way back up. They've made their way back into podium contention. So this is exactly what long-time Le Mans racer Andy Wallace wants to see, isn't it? Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to see Andy? Wallace on the podium. He, he certainly deserves it. Those guys have done a sterling job throughout the race. They're running third now at the expense of the Highcroft Racing Acura that uh, I think is still in the pits. It's a great shame for them, but uh, good for the RML boys. Another, another British team. Another huge moment there for um, Oak Racing, currently in second place. This is one of the Pascarolo cars. Both of those Pascarolos still running, which I think, like I said earlier, I think is fantastic. It's a bit of a tribute to Henri since he's not here this year, which I, I feel he's greatly missed. I think he's, he's a big part of Le Mans, isn't he, Chris? Oh, tremendous. He's, he's always... Uh, the crowds love him, the organisers love him, and uh, the media, of course, absolutely adore him. He is very much part of, of the race and has been for... 40, 40 years, I About believe, they said. Years, yes. I think he only missed one Le Mans, which was purely based upon a fire that he was caught up in, so he actually physically couldn't drive in it. But he's been 40 years either as a driver or an entrant. And I think he is the, the driver who started it the most times. Oh, is it? Oh, yep. wow. God, that's an accomplishment, isn't it? And I heard that he was planning to go fishing this weekend, but I must say he's been next door to us a lot of the time doing some commentary for um, Eurosport France, I think, so he couldn't stay away. And when he's not there, He's, uh, I think he's doing a blog for, for Le Keep as well. So. Yeah, he couldn't resist, could he? <laughs> as, as we keep on saying, this place is a drug. Once you start to come, you, you just can't stop it. <laughs> as, as, as we were having shots there of the uh, DBR9 young driver Aston Martin with Thomas Enger at the wheel, that car is slowly clawing back on Gabriel Gardel in the Celine. Uh, still five laps down, though, but uh, in the last 30, 30, 40 minutes, it's, it's clawed another lap back. So... Uh, tough ask to try and win that class but uh, anything can happen we still over, have over three and a half hours of racing to go here at Le Mans and certainly in GT1 we've seen it swap it up just as much as we have in GT2 I think those have been the two classes where the most turnarounds have been really and we're seeing you know some of the older cars like the Celine really hanging on to the top position it's really going to be sad to uh, to miss GT1 see we've only got three cars left in the class so I do think maybe the ACO is right maybe these cars aren't really durable enough for this sort of racing anymore but it will be sad to see them go when it's there it certainly will they are they are wonderful cars i know we've both had the uh, privilege to drive uh, a number of them and uh, they're a great car especially uh, my favorite is the is the dbr9 it sounds beautiful it looks beautiful and uh you know, it's just a pleasure to drive. I agree. I, I still remember the, the first day I ever drove the DVR9 and I fired up the engine in pit lane and was like, oh yeah, <laughs> it's just awesome. It's and, nothing uh, better than that engine. The other day, the, uh, a couple of years ago at Sebring, I bought the most lovely bookmark, which is the, a clear picture of a, a DB9 in profile. And it just has, it is just everyone's idea of what a GT car should look like. I agree. I, th I think it is the epitome of, of GT1 car and just the sound, the shape, everything about it and um, quite a tricky car to drive actually it's a bit it's a bit loose but but definitely something uh, something of a special car to drive and in fact it looks like we're going to get an interview from um, one of the drivers of the Aston Martin we're gonna have an interview with Peter Cox and we are going to head down there now with Sebastian Peter Cox Peter Cox you're a second in the GT1 category it's a question of survival here well, survival, yes, as always, but uh, we still try to push, you know. Uh, we had a problem in the beginning of the race, unfortunately. Now uh, the Aston Martin is running really well, and uh, we just try to take as much time out of the Celine as possible and uh, hope they have a problem or a mistake, you know. In my stint, the, the driver went off as well, so uh, if we keep uh, putting pressure, maybe something will happen and we can still win the race. Your car is called the Young Driver Aston Martin. Where does that come from? Sorry? Your car is called the Young Driver Aston Martin. Where does that come from? I don't know. You have to ask the team. Okay. But what's the plan for the rest of the day? You're going back into the car? No, as I said, we try to do uh, as fast as safe laps as possible and see if the race will come to us. It's still a few hours to go, so everything can still happen. Okay. Thank you very much.
an interview with uh, Peter Cox. I'm not sure whether whether you viewers got any of that. We certainly didn't, and uh, I'm no lip reader, but I'm sure he was saying uh, we're pushing uh, pushing very hard and trying to get on terms, but it's going to be a bit of a tough ask. He looked pretty chirpy. He looked like they were feeling a bit better about being back up there, at least in a slightly fighting position, albeit about five laps away from that Celine. But all it would take is for something else to happen to the Celine. We've seen it have a little blip already today. If anything went wrong, they would be ready, waiting to pounce. So I'm sure they've been pushing as hard as they can. A new fast lap for Darren Turner's car. That is the 009 um, Aston Martin, the petrol leading car. If we say our little subclass, our own subclass of uh, the petrol cars in LMP1. Still running in sixth place. And he's just done the quickest time for that car in this race. And also, sorry, sorry, Stuart. Also, uh, um, uh, the fastest lap for the car with Andre Lotterer in no, the, no, number two car, two car, uh, in number, number eight, eight car. car in second place. <laughs> Got my words the wrong way around. But uh, yes, he set uh, a 321.5, so their best lap. So they really are pushing on to keep ahead of uh, the Peugeot with Alexander Wurtz in it. Darren Turner has actually gone three seconds quicker than he did in qualifying. So that car is going really, really, really well at the moment. And Darren Turner really trying to um, eke out that gap on uh, Christian Backard. We're going to go to a break and uh, we'll be back with you uh, fairly soon. Welcome back to the Le Mans 24 Hours 2010 live here on Eurosport. And it's all been going on in all these classes, especially in GT2, where there's been a huge turnaround. We've lost both of the Corvette racing Corvettes. And I've got here a quote from um, race program manager Doug Feehan. He says, unfortunately, it appears to be an engine failure. Uh, this is the number 63 car, I believe. Our first in 11 years of racing at Le Mans, says, uh, says Doug Feehan. We'll get the car back, take it apart, determine what the problem was, resolve it, and move forward. The engine was running perfectly one minute and then not perfectly the next. Now, this is a huge, huge smack for Corvette. I mean, like he says, their first failure. Oh, it's just shocking, isn't it? And we're going to go down to the pits quickly for an interview with Mark Lieb, also in GT2. Mark Lieb, you're leading the GT2 category. Finally, there's a lot of things happening in this category. How is it going for you guys? At the moment, it's going very well. The cars are running fine. Um, we can do consistent lap times, but um, it's still three hours and 45 minutes to go. What about your program? Are you going to climb back into the car later because you're already in, uh, not in a real race suit here? Yeah, I just have enough time, you know, I can relax. We're doing double stint, so Richie just got out of the car, now it's Wolf. And then the last two hours, I'm in the car. Okay, you're two laps ahead of the Ferrari. Does it change your strategy? Are you trying to keep it safe? Yeah, definitely. We're trying to keep it safe. You're not going maximum attack anymore like we did in the night when we were chasing the Corvettes. We have to look after the car a little bit now, but it's yeah, it's a, it's a strange feeling. It's a, we are all very nervous. Uh, I guess, especially after last year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the last year the race was was finished very early, and uh, this year we have a really good chance to win it. So hopefully, we can do it. Okay, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mark Lieb really hoping to win this class this year, and it is so stressful at this time in the race because you feel like you're almost to the finish, but you're still quite a ways off, and so much of sports car racing and endurance racing is luck. I mean, it really does come down to the machinery you have, and everyone can work hard, but sometimes it just doesn't go your way, and we're just seeing some of the debris on the track really starts to heat up at this time of day, doesn't it, Stuart? It does. There's so much there's so much debris offline. Everyone's getting a bit tired. Mistakes are creeping in. Uh, this is this is the part of the race where you really, really, really do need to focus and uh, you really do need to have your wits about you because uh, it's, it's the place where you can really lose it. And uh, there are a lot of cars out there. Mark was just telling me that, that, that there are 22 retirements out of the 55 starters, so we've still got 33 cars out there. That's a lot of overtaking, a lot of being forced offline and uh, picking up all, all, all that debris on the road. Funnily enough, though, that'll start to feel almost empty to some of these drivers who are used to having the full 55 and qualifying. And it's it's funny because when you've had a, a little bit of a break and you've been driving and you have maybe a few hours off and you get back in and when you've lost quite a few cars, you do sort of start to notice it and you think, 
wow, I'm not getting past as much or passing as much on the straights. And you start, it's almost a little bit depressing because you start to realize they're dropping off and you start to think, oh gosh, I hope it's not going to be my car. But also it's, it, it's actually a nice time of day because there is less traffic out there. Absolutely. The circuit's really rubbered in. As we're seeing with uh, guys like Darren Turner, they're, they're pulling in some stunningly quick laps right at this time and it must be it must be it must be a joy to drive absolutely it's great to be lower on traffic no doubt about that um but certainly i know this time of day you're starting to get really tired i remember um, driving towards the end of the 2006 race and so many problems oh we've got a slow moving car on track this is disaster this is the Stracker racing car thankfully he's right in front of pit lane it is nick leventis at the wheel this is the uh the car owner team owner even we're going to have to wait and see what the problem is. Hopefully, it's nothing too detrimental. They do have a little bit of a lead. They've actually got quite a big lead over the Oak Racing car. They've got a six-lap lead over them. So if they can get this car back out on track soon, he should be all right. Looks like he's going to get out of the car because he's just undid his water, and he'll be taking the radio off soon. So I think we'll see a driver change, and hopefully we'll find out what's going on. Yeah, big news for Stacker Racing because uh, we, well, we thought they had it sewn up, but again, it's, it's still three and a half hours to go. So... Uh, you know, they'll fuel it, they'll tire it, then they'll investigate what sort of problem is. We see uh, Nick Leventis getting out, Johnny Kane getting in. Um, Johnny Kane, a uh, part of the BRDC marathon team with uh, Ollie Gavin, another sub three hour marathon runner. So um, he's certainly fit enough to drive, a, drive one of these cars. Absolutely, another another class leader has just come in for pits. That is the Celine number 50. Looks like they are not doing a driver change. I think they've purely just given the driver some water. So Gabriel Gardel looks to be staying in the car. Looks routine, they've cleaned the windscreen. Should be firing up the engine in a minute and back out on track. So that car seems to be running all right at the moment, but I don't want to give it the curse of the commentator. So I'm not going to say too much. And we're trying to, trying to look out of our window here. We've got it on screen now. The uh the Johnny Kane uh, Stracker Racing uh, Acura, bit of a bit of a long stop. They seem to be changing over some uh, some water. Uh, maybe this is just precaution because they do have a 10 lap lead. They can afford to go about things a little bit slowly and a little bit more methodically. So um, so we'll, uh, we'll 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 see six lap lead. Sorry, not 10 lap, it's six lap. Of course, it has been a long night. Um, <laughs> but we're, we're we're now looking at. I think that's the number 30. Is that number 35? No. No, it's not. I think that's the uh, one 20, of the, oak racing the, cars. The, four, the 24 Oak Racing car. The, the, that car's not a not a threat to the, the Stracker car. Um, that's the uh, gentleman driver car, I think. But uh, the Oak Racing 35 car is a threat. Six lap down. So hopefully, just a routine check up for the Stracker car, and it'll be out soon. Well, I have to say they don't look very panicked. So I'm wondering if maybe Nick himself just let off a little bit on his way into pit lane. It's hard, it's hard to say really, we just don't really know, but they don't seem to be too panicked, so hopefully this is not an issue. Johnny Kane's in there very calmly indeed, just waiting to get the call to, to go out. Uh, maybe just taping a bit of loose body work. We did see in fact that he did have a little bit of contact with Roman Dumas at the Ford Chicane, so uh, just uh, precautionally taping up the bodywork, making sure it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't disperse going down the straight or anything like that to uh, cause an accident. It seems to be a remarkably relaxed pit stop, in fact, when, uh, when you, all the panic when he came in, but uh, they don't seem to be doing very much at all. I think it's possible that maybe... Um Maybe Nick just came in a little bit quieter. Maybe he was even low on fuel. We Yellow don't really know. Then. Oh, no. This is a disaster. Number 15. This is the, one of the Colas Christian Audi cars. Backwards. Christian Backerud. Yes, um, this is not good. I'm not entirely sure what this is. Do you know where it is, Stuart? No, it's, uh, it's a gravel bed at the moment. Yeah. But, well, <laughs> I, I but which thought, gravel bed is I, the big question. I thought it was Indianapolis. <laughs> it looks like the gravel bed in Indianapolis. I was just thinking that because it is a really big, wide one. Um, and, and a very common place to go off at this time in the day, actually, when you know, you never know what could happen there, but this is a real disaster for them. They'd been running, you know, really right up there in, in the top 10. They're running in seventh place, so really not what we want to be happening this close to the end. But hopefully if they, there's not too much damage, the, the tracks will come along. It is Indianapolis. It's the same sort of place where Giancarlo Fisichella went off, but just, just he hit the tyres properly and uh, Fisichella didn't. But hopefully they'll be able to tow that car out. Those R10s are very, very strong, so... Uh, the Audi boys will be able to, well, the Collars Audi boys will probably be able to rebuild that in a number of seconds. 
it doesn't look like it's been a big impact, does it? And thankfully, I think the gravel bed has done its job there. I mean, that is why we have the gravel beds, obviously, is to help slow these cars down from speed, because they would have been coming in at a huge amount of pace into that turn and braking very, very hard. So he's been lucky there, I think, and um, hopefully he's going to get him back. Now the job will be not spreading that gravel across the whole racing line. And uh, just had a, a word in my ear from Jeremy Shaw, who's in the booth, saying, was uh, the 15 car chasing down 009? Was he actually pushing a little bit too hard and uh, and went off? But there seems to be very little damage. As long as he's kept the engine going, or can get the engine going, uh, he should be able to get that one back. In fact, there seems to be no damage at all. Yes, uh, uh, a rare mistake this race from, uh, from the number 15 Audi. They've been running very, very well. And uh, thankfully, not too much damage. And, yeah. uh, one lap behind the Darren Turner uh, 009 Aston Martin, so he was chasing, but Darren's probably five, six seconds a lap quicker than uh, Bakarud at the moment. So uh, Darren, as we see gravel being spread everywhere, again, that's more debris on the circuit, more, more punches. Aston Martin will be breathing a little bit easier at the moment. And there's the sister car. The maimed Audi in the uh, car graveyard that we have going on here at Le Mans. Such a depressing sight. Number 24 car coming in for a pit stop. This is not the car running in second place, but in fact the other car, which is currently running in fifth place, I believe, in LMP2. They've had a pretty, pretty decent run. And I think we are going to be lucky enough to have a interview with Nick Leventis, and we're going down to the pits now to speak with him. Stracker Racing. Nick Leventis, you're just coming out of the car. How did it go? Yeah, it was good. Obviously, uh, when Hydecroft went out, we backed off the pace a little bit. Unfortunately, I had a punch on the inlap, but uh, yeah, it's good. We're just trying to take it easy and make it to the end of the race. Anyway, I suppose you're taking the, the wheel uh, the next time, the last stint. What is the program until the end of the race? It's to just uh, solely stay out of trouble. You can see in the last few hours that a lot of cars have gone off and uh, caused damage and spinning and cutting across the, the gravel bed. So I think it's just a case of being really, really disciplined now. Um, really look after the car, nurse it home. We've got a few laps advantage, so there's no need for heroics at this stage. We just saw the crew nursing the car really well with a lot of gaffer tape. Is that the first part of it? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's been through a, a hell of a ride, hasn't it, through the night and since three o'clock yesterday afternoon. So anything we can to make it uh, doubly sure, you know, uh, we'll do it. So it's had a bit of oil, fresh tyres now for Johnny. And um, yeah, I mean, the clock's still ticking. There's a long way to go. So we're not counting our chickens just yet. Thank you very much. I think you're absolutely right there, Chris. They've just done a few little top ups, made a quick little look over on the car when it came in earlier, just to make sure everything is absolutely spot on. And the best thing that could have happened to this team was to have Highcroft go out, because now they can take a deep breath and just chill out and make sure that they look after that car. And I know we've, had, we've seen a huge turnaround in uh, LMP1, but what about LMP2? Stracker really have come right at the right time. Of course, uh, Mark, and I, Mark Cole and I are very happy because this is our local team. Uh, we know quite a few of the people uh, involved in the team, but it really is fabulous. They've, they've, uh, they've had so many problems up till now, and, and, and they're off. And they've had a really good Le Mans. They have so far, but uh, Chris, three hours 30 to go. So like Danny yeah. Watt said, they're not going to start counting their chickens yet because... The, cur uh, the curse of the commentator. Yeah. There I is a long way to go. I think they absolutely have the right mindset right now, though. You can tell all three of those drivers know what they're doing right. Uh, you know, at the moment. I think Nick Leventis did a great job to look after it and keep it out of trouble. He's really just putting in the consistent lap times now, and they all have a job at hand, and that job is to keep hold of that car and bring it through the checkered flag in first place. It's in the middle of the night we were we were saying that we thought the other drivers would take over and let Nick uh, have, a, have a quiet time and we saw a driver in that car doing very consistent times and lo and behold it was Nick in the middle of the night about 2.30 he was going and doing very consistent lap times they, they've all held up extremely well. Well I think it's nice for Nick he is the team owner and it's great he wants to be there and wants to be driving and wants to be part of it and I think it's wonderful for them to have held this lead throughout virtually the entire race I think 
there was only a quick swap about early on, but they've mostly just kept the charge forward for LMP2, been very, very strong. And uh, like I say, I think I think I should stop talking now because I'm worried I'm going to make, <laughs> make something happen that shouldn't be there. Yeah, we'll just we'll just leave the, the striker racing to do what they're doing. Let's 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 talk about a Peugeot for a bit, shall we? <laughs> we're, on board the number, we're on board the number one Peugeot coming up to the second second chicane now with uh, Alex Verts on board. Last lap round was a three minute twenty point. 004, so they're still trucking on very, very nicely indeed. And uh, as we see, Tom Christensen now has just done the, his fastest middle sector of the race. And last lap round, he'd done his fastest lap of the race, which is a 321.9. So they're trying to come um, to, to hunt down Alexander Wurtz as well. I think as much as that, I think they're trying to keep that gap away from Lapierre because he's really pushing hard. He's been doing a 321.4 and Christensen did a 321.9. There's not a very big gap between those two cars. So like I said, when Dindo Capello spoke to me earlier, he said they have to push very, very hard hard just to even keep the position they're in, even though it's currently not a podium position. So an interesting, unique situation they're in. Well, they've got to, they've got to try, try and keep uh, Alexander Wurtz honest as well. And uh, number seven, actually, of Christensen has actually been been shown the warning flag because he's exceeding track limits. So uh, he's uh, <laughs> doing all he can to keep uh, Wurtz honest and uh, hopefully push Wurtz into a mistake that will give uh, Rockefeller and Lotterer in front of him some breathing space. I've just noticed something, I don't know if it's already been announced or not, but I'm seeing a retirement on the board. The um, first of the Lola Astons to be out of the race completely. That is a 008 car. Um, of Vanina Eeks was in the car at the time. I, I'm not sure what happened. We saw that car have some impact into a barrier off the second chicane not too long ago. It then managed to get itself back to the pits, but I think perhaps there's been some ta terminal damage there. So really unfortunate for a team that had run so strongly alongside the uh, 009 and earlier the 007 car. They, they were doing a very, very good job and all three drivers were holding their own and uh, that car on Dunlop tyres, not Michelin, so uh, slightly different uh, slightly different setup to the, to the works cars, but doing a very, very good job in their own. Yeah, absolutely. And nice to see the 007 car is back in action and hasn't hasn't actually lost too much. And oh no, we've got a number eight second place Audi in the tires. Is that off Arnage? It I, certainly I, looks, looks like, like it. Like Arnage, Another yes. one caught out by the slippery surface at Arnage, or have they had a problem? This could be disaster for Audi. He's got it going again. We'll see how long they can be in the pits. And is, is there much damage? Because he's uh, he, he, he's accelerated off very very quickly indeed. He may have just outbraked himself. I think we'll see yeah. him pop into the pits probably for a quick look over, but hopefully he'll be able to carry on. But that's so easily done. We're seeing the best of the best even doing it in exactly the same time as Alexander Wurtz has done a fastest yeah. sector time of the entire race. Not ideal timing. So uh, yeah, this is game on. This is um, Wurtz has uh, just done his second set, done a 319.8. And uh, Andre Lotter has been in the wall. So uh, <laughs> suddenly it all comes alive again. And we're just going to go down to pits for an interview with uh, Bakker with the um, Cola Saudi. Christian Bakker, I think we saw you a little bit off the track. Uh, what happened? Well, we were using uh, some soft tires, for, which usually we use uh, in the evenings. But again, they, they were starting to understeer a little bit because the temperature was coming up and uh, I got a little, I came into the corner a little bit too fast and off the line, I don't know if you can see it, there's a lot of stones and things like this and as soon as you miss the, the racing line a little bit, then you just understeer off and that's basically what happened. You're sevens overall at the moment, uh, good result for you guys? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we are with quite, quite an old car here, you know, it's still obviously a car which has won quite a few times, but to be honest, I, I think we, we should all be quite pleased, uh, apart from that little mistake I made. I, I am quite pleased with the weekend so far. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Well. As we hear from uh, Christian Backer, Andre Lotto, like you say, Liz, is coming into the pits. Uh, this will probably just be an earlier than scheduled routine stop with a change of a nose that will, will probably take 10, 15 seconds with the Audi. Look, you see the Audi boys go to work now. They're well drilled on all this. They'll have been practicing this from... Uh, from, 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 from the start of the week uh, in the workshop so they know exactly what they're doing. You see the old nose coming off now, a little bit of a struggle to get it off, but we'll see a new nose coming on now, hopefully. So it suggests there's no suspension damage. Always getting caught in an air hose as well. It's going from bad to worse for Audi at the moment. 
Um, but uh, yeah, that nose going on fine now, and uh, hopefully they can get that car out in front of Alexander Wurtz. The unfortunate thing here, of course, is he's only four laps into his stint, which Jeremy Shaw's just pointed out to me, and that is not good news for them. They don't want to be pitting early, especially with the likes of Alexander Wurtz putting in incredible times, like a three minute 19 on his last lap. And you can bet anything that Peugeot is down that radio going, here's your chance, mate. Push that thing as hard as you can, as long as you can keep it on the track. Push it hard. You don't even have to stay on the track all the time. Just make sure it comes back. And <laughs> Alexander Wurtz, defending champion here. So uh, he'll, 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 he'll know he wants to repeat that, definitely. All to play for right now. So we'll just see how fast the Audi boys can make this happen. It's back off the jacks. I think we're going to see it making a move very quickly. What a speedy recovery. I don't think we'll see any team here that well prepared who can do that fast of a turnaround when the car has just had an impact with the wall. No, Audi really are second to none in that, and uh, they have been since they, since they came back into sports cars all those years ago. Well, we saw much earlier in the week when we had um, Alan McNish grab hold of the mic and wander us around the Audi pits that they have all their spare packages lined up perfectly so that they can just grab hold of things and put them on as they need to, which is exactly the way you need to be. And look at that. Alexander Wurtz has answered the call from Peugeot and just done another fastest sector time, sector three time, the fastest of the race, not and, just the car. And we believe that puts him on the same lap as the uh, number eight car. So the whole thing is... Is, is coming back right down one one minute 54 seconds between the two of them now and the fastest lap of the race he's just done <laughs> and uh, there's, there's still three hours and 22 minutes to go so uh, there, there really is just everything to go for here the only thing is that the number nine Audi is still a lap ahead but oh. uh, they really have to keep themselves on it now it's uh complete role reversal the the hunters have now become the hunted Absolutely. and uh, we're seeing a, we're seeing a good last last three hours or so of the race pan out the real no pressure, pressure you do realize <laughs> <laughs> no pressure on andrew lotter at all no. <laughs> he's now just put the pressure on himself by having that bit of an off and now it's going to be right made off you go push as hard as you can because by the way alexander wartz has just done the best best uh, lap of the entire race and he's not far off so um Time to find something special in that Audi. Uh, there's not a moment's a break here. Unbelievable. You, you nip off for a quick cup of coffee and all hell breaks loose. Uh, phenomenal push by Persia. Uh, they're still on the march here and uh, Alexander Wurtz is heading for second place. Uh, there is uh, the number one car. They've not given any quarter, no matter whose hands this number one car has been in. And uh, this skirmish is going to go right down to the wire. Nobody can quite predict it. There's been a lot of questions about the range of the Persians uh, when they are running on uh, full juice as they are now but look at this they're absolutely side well they will be side by side in just a few moments time one can only assume uh, is this this is this is a this is um it's just approaching uh, the back of uh, Lotter. behind it is it Lotterer? yes i believe so, so this is for position oh. It is for position, Lotter's absolutely. not going to hand that over in a hurry, No, he's is not. He? He's seen him within sight. They've been getting closer and closer to each other right now on course. Uh, this is unbelievable. And they're just coming down into Arnage corner. He's just about to unlap himself, I believe, we've just been told. My, my, my bad. Sorry, I was getting a bit overexcited on that, <laughs> as Jeremy just pointed out. He's still not going to hand it over, is he? No, he doesn't, doesn't even want to give position, but he's snaking now. The Peugeot is... Uh, the, I wonder if he's got some kind of issue. I'm wondering if he's actually... Uh, surely it can't be a fuel issue at this point. No, he may have uh, picked up some debris on his tyres. Uh, places like Arnage and uh, Indianapolis, we've seen many, many, many cars go off, and there's all sorts of stuff over the circuit. So if you, Stuart, if you do they, run wide... They've been told to just go absolutely flat out. I think basically all cards on the table. It's all in uh, in poker parlance. Uh, for Persia at this point. You can see they're, they're just uh, at the moment looking at very, very loose all over the racetrack here. This is fantastic racing and exactly what we need. And who would have believed it we could get to this point when you had a look last night? Uh, there's been so many turnings of the page here. There'll be more stories to be told here as they come back onto the start finish straight and everybody leans out to watch them come by here as they head off up the hill towards Dunlop. Carlton, that is for position. It that is, is for position. position. That is on Dray Lotter. So this I is racing. It, it absolutely is. They are racing right now. As soon as he got uh, a view of him, he knew that this was the moment. Uh, the streams uh, telling their own fibs here, but they come across the line, and this is for second place. It's a battle for second place in the 24 hours of Le Mans. Out front, we've got uh, uh, the Rockefeller.
Schaefer on the nine car at the moment, but this is Lotto under all kinds of pressure from Alexander Verz, and this push is going to go very, very deep into this lap. This is what it's all about in sports car racing at this level with these top teams and top drivers. Here we are so far into this 24-hour race when so many cars have fallen by the wayside, and here we are having a race for position only just three hours from the end of a 24-hour race. And you wait until you see the uh, the straight line speed of the Peugeot. The Peugeot is cat. Look look at the rate of knots is catching Lotter in a straight line. There's now four of these to come. This lap, these straight lines. So uh, Lotter is going to have to have his defending head on right now. It seems that uh, whenever it gets to a little technical section, when it gets a little bit twisty, the Peugeot has just uh, got its work cut out here. But we're straight lining right now, and let's see that uh, Audi. Don't forget, bit uh, flat fronted. It punches a big hole in the air, and uh, you you just feel as we as we cut away once more, we're getting back. On on board and we're just losing pictures I think on the relay and there they are side by side and this is for second place and it looks like he's there they're coming into the chicane they've got to be so careful as they go into here and he does he keeps it sensible for once thank goodness not getting airborne and the one car moves into second place as of now traffic ahead of them superb racing and great that Peugeot have just taken the bit between their teeth and they are running with this one I think that would have been the one time that Andrew Lutter would have been praying for traffic on that straight he would have been praying that someone something could have stopped that Peugeot but the charge it gives in a straight line so much quicker there was nothing he could do earlier on in the race we saw as they got to that point here is the pass now on board from the Peugeot number one car living up to its number and uh, when we got to this after I thought we were back with live pictures but we're not still this is the move and using even he may well even get called uh, for uh, just extending off the track there that's been a occasion uh, on occasion they have actually been called for that but both teams as well Audi and Peugeot such is the pace that they've carried through this race so far. Now, um, Jeremy's just had a word in my ear. It seems the Vert's car is due for a pit stop, so they are out of sequence. Although Andre Lotterer had to come in and make a very early stop because of his little misdemeanor at Arnage, uh, the Vert's car has one more stop to make, I believe. Um, so uh, it's not as close as we think um, at the moment, but. Uh, you know that that that, that number that, num that number one Peugeot is closing fast. Well, they definitely would have fueled Andrew Lotterer when he came in, even though he'd only been out for four laps. I'm sure they would have fueled him up, so he will have virtually a full stint's worth of fuel to go, which is going to be very useful for him if um, Alexander Wurtz is about to pit. But still, you're not going to Audi's not going to want to give that away either way. Number nine, the race leader, has just come into the pits. I think this is routine. Don't see any stressful looking actions in the Audi pit. So yeah, as we see, it's Verts in the pits. Jeremy, you're entirely right. That was uh, that was the lap he was coming into pit, and uh, on Andre Lotter has now retaken second place. But uh, we're going to go down to the pits, and we're going to hear from Andre Lotter's teammate Benoit Trillier. Benoit, we just saw the Peugeot overtaking your car number eight. What does that change for the strategy for the rest of the race? Uh, you know, we have to, uh, to do our best all the time. We have to do less mistake as possible, go as quick as possible. And uh, sometimes, you know, in Arnage, it's very difficult when you really push hard to, to feel the grip and to do a little mistake. It's very quick. So what's happened to Andre can happen to anyone when they chase the other one. So anyway, it's uh, we are still on the podium and the race is not finished. So we still hope to do a good job. We saw the team changing the front of the car. What actually happened? Sorry? We saw the team changing the front of the car at your car. What was broken? I think the front bonnet was a little bit damaged and uh, they changed to make it new. Okay, when are you going back into the car? Are you going back into the car? Yeah, I should go back in the car for the last stint of the last two stints. Thank you very much. Interesting enough, it, uh, the last run, uh, the last stint for the number one car was 12 laps. So they've managed to find something while keeping the pace. They've got themselves into second place. Even if the race finished right now, I think uh, that would be a huge, huge plaudits for Peugeot. They've battled their way. They've never said, uh, never said die. Audi did exactly the same thing. Uh, we saw the race come to Audi. Is it now coming the way of uh, Alexander Wurtz here and the number one Peugeot? We've seen it uh, zigzag ever so slightly on on course i think as it's just got a little bit offline it's uh, it's starting to squirrel a little bit out there liz it is i think they're having to push very very hard and we heard benoit even saying you know sometimes these things happen when you're told to push really hard so he's even admitted that even the best will make mistakes when they're just under that sort of pressure and 
A lot of pressure to be under at this stage in a 24-hour race, Carlton. Yeah, an awful lot of pressure, Mark. Uh, both teams riding it very, very well indeed. Uh, nobody's been relaxed. Uh, Audi didn't exactly celebrate either when Peugeot had their issues. They knew that uh, being out in front, being the head, being chased down by the house was always perhaps going to have its issues. And uh, they, you cannot count on anything here, can you? No, I mean, but the, our main problem here is that Lotterer has been prone to making mistakes. They did it at Spa, the opening, uh, even the formation lap at the Spa 1,000 kilometers. They put that car on the wall. Here he is. He makes a, a, just a, a rookie mistake, if you like. I mean, it's a big, big pressure on Lotterer. The only thing that's going in his favor at the moment is uh, the, the, the shorter runs of Peugeot is having to make the last... Uh, we had 11 laps, 7 laps, then we're back to 12 on the last run, I believe. But they should be able to squeeze 13 out of these fuel tanks. Uh, they should be. They've been as low as 11 when they've been on the push, Peugeot, and even less than that on some of their runs. We'll take a break back in a moment. Uh, welcome back. You're live uh, to Eurosport. Well, we uh, all thought that uh, the main talking points would be around about the GTs and that um, uh, because of the performance differential, as we thought, between the Peugeots and the Audis after qualification, that this would be a, a, a tale already told. It has been completely the opposite. Uh, we've had uh, plenty to talk about within the GTs, but it's been illuminating from the very first, uh, Jeremy Shaw, uh, this uh, P1 category has been absolutely fascinating thrilling yeah it has it's been it's been very very interesting almost exciting perhaps i mean there's certainly been there have been uh, some great mem memories that i think we will take away from this event fascinating contest as you say they're going on now the alex verts car shares with Anthony davidson and mark janay they've been turning a series of stunning lap times absolutely incredible lap times by that car earlier on in the race last night they were they were doing 13 laps on a tank of diesel fuel now they're only getting 12 laps that's because instead of doing what was then fast lap times around about 3 minutes 22 now they're down to 3 minutes 19 3 minutes 20 on a fairly regular basis which is a stunning pace but you know even at the pace they're running now uh, Wurtz uh, is now back up to speed he's 53 seconds behind Andre Lotterer and uh, and that's, he's more than a lap down still to our race leader, Mike Rockefeller in car number nine. And by my reckoning, Rockefeller and Wurtz, number nine in the, the overall race leader, and uh, the chasing Alex Wurtz on similar fuel strategies. So I reckon they've probably got a similar number of fuel stops to the end of the race, which means that it's going to be very, very difficult now, I believe, for Alex Wurtz to catch Mike Rockefeller. However, he's certainly in with a shot of catching uh, the second place car of Andre Lotter well, at the very least. Lotter is going to be so focused now he's, he's made that mistake and he doesn't want to be the guy who costs Audi a 1-2 here and he'll be so so focused he won't make another error now but how much quicker is this guy can he catch him just a LMP2 just to let you know that uh, Nick Leventis has finished his driving in the LMP2 leading car brought the car back in with a rear, left rear puncture they had to change the legality panel at the rear Johnny Kane's taken over and he and Danny Watts two of the quickest drivers here this weekend will do the rest of the driving I think, crucially, what they now have amongst Peugeot is a belief. Uh, first, they had disappointment, uh, then they had hope, and now they've got belief. They have worked their way back into this one, Jeremy, and uh, they are totally, totally committed here. They may have had a brief hiatus for a stop here, but they now know that the second place could well be theirs, and you never know, they might take a further step forward. You never know. Uh, I think certainly second place is at least is on for that car number one. The lead? I don't know. We'll see. We'll be back on Eurosport in just a couple of moments. And a very warm welcome to you. We're spread across uh, Eurosport now as we're uh, bidding a farewell to Eurosport 2. We're bridging to Eurosport International. We've had an absolutely thrilling Le Mans 24 hours. If you're only just joining us, then <laughs> buy the DVD. Unbelievable racing throughout all classes. Absolutely uh, gobsmacking on occasion. Uh, the number 